some lowness some lowness of the notes right there for all you guys what's going on everybody uh matt bell here at the electric violin shop and we are talking today about six and seven that's ridiculous six and seven string violins that's right um so yes it's a thing I know the uh, the guys Brett and Eddie don't uh, they don't uh, you know they don't subscribe to all that, but they're not the arbiters of all that exists in the string world, and uh, you know sometimes you just got to step outside the box a little bit. So yes, six and seven string violins are a thing. We uh, we talked about five string violins a couple weeks ago, and why would you want a five string violin? Well, that extra range is pretty nice if you are improvising. Uh, it's also nice if you're playing in a band and you want to be able to take up some uh, some spaces that are that are different from a traditional four string violin. It's also nice if you're working a job and you want to be able to take violin or viola parts. But what if that's just not enough? What if just that low C an octave below middle C? What if that's just not enough? For me, it's not. I play a six. This is actually a used seven string that we got in that is, uh, it's on our website. It is for sale right now. Um, so yeah, for me, I like the six. I like the playability of the six um, with the extended range. The seven gives even more range. And uh, we'll sort of talk about what those strings are. I guess we'll start with that. Like what heck is a six or a seven string violin? So we actually, with uh, like with a four string, E, A, D, G, Play that one in tune maybe um you go down a fifth to c like your five string violin go down another fifth to f and then if you just need more than that low b flat so that is where all that is headed so the seven string violin goes down to b flat it turns out that even seven isn't enough for some people the nerve um guys like Chuck Bontrager and some of those guys that want to go heavier, 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 and lower. Um, there is, they do make an even lower string, an E flat string. And, uh, and then John Jordan, because John Jordan is John Jordan, he made a nine string one time because somebody just insisted on it and there wasn't anywhere to go below low E flat. So he said, well, Let's, uh, let, let's find, we'll have to go up a little bit and we'll go up to, uh, you can't go up to a high B, the string will just break. So we went up to a high A as if, uh, you know, E strings aren't screechy enough already. Um, went to a high A. So there's a high open A string on that nine string violin and it goes down to a low E flat. Um, so yeah, you know, sometimes you just need a little more and uh, that's what you get. So um, I went on the Electric String Players Forum earlier this week. It's raining around here and I'm having a bad hair day. I'm sorry. Um, I went on the Electric String Players Forum on Facebook earlier this week and asked, I said, hey, we're going to be doing a, a live stream on six and seven string violins. What do you guys want to hear about? Do you have any comments you want to make? And there were a bunch of questions and some discussions on there. Really cool. If you're not part of the Electric String Players Forum on Facebook, you should be part of that forum. There's some really cool people there from all over the world. Lots and lots of different opinions, which is wonderful. Um, but everybody's been really cool and respectful, even when we disagree with each other. So it's a cool platform. And uh, Trevor Dick out of um, Ontario has done a fantastic job of uh, running that forum. Hey, what's happening in the Dominican Republic? Espero que todo esta bien allá. Um, let's see who's here on Facebook. Man, we got so many cool people. Joseph Shack for Rob Janoff, Corey Zillish, Raz. Everybody's here. Karen Griffin. What's up, everybody? So many extended range players here. Like Joseph, he's he's just delved into the five string world, but the rest of these guys are six and seven string players. Awesome. 
So, um, yeah, some of the most knowledgeable people in the world sitting right here on Facebook um, with you guys. So if, you, uh, if you've got questions about sixes and sevens that I cannot answer, uh, Raz or Rob or any of those guys can answer those questions. Corey's got a seven. Uh, and then somebody is in, where's somebody? In uh, Connecticut, balmy Connecticut. Those are words you don't hear all the time. Lars Thorson, what's happening, brother? Tara's here. She's soon to be a seven-string player. Lars uh, can play anything with strings on it. So, uh, man, all these cool people. We're talking about six- and seven-string violins today. Um, one of the first questions that came, I think this was Corey's question on the Facebook side of things, was asking her about alternate tunings. Okay, so when I first, I told you what the, what the strings are on here, right? I told you what all the strings are. I, well, that's what they come from the factory, right? But because we're extended range people and uh, we don't follow the rules, um, you know, we don't have to follow the rules. If you don't want to tune that low string to a B flat, nobody's going to make you. You don't have to do it. Um, it's 3 a.m. in Perth. Awesome. Uh, well, that's just about time to start thinking about heading to bed, maybe. Um, I was actually up at 3 o'clock this morning to take my wife to the airport, and that messed me all up. So I'm, I'm a little punchy today. It's because I slept for a couple hours, and I was up, and then I slept a couple hours, and here I am. Um, but yeah, alternate tunings. Chuck Bontrager is kind of the, the, the big daddy of all these alternate tunings on seven-string violins. Um, Chuck is the um, is a concertmaster for Hamilton in Chicago. He is a is a renowned classical four string player. Chuck is a beast on the four string violin. Uh, he's a bigger beast on his seven string viper, and he's actually got several of them. Um, uh, Chuck was part of a tool tribute band that did not have a guitar player. He covered all that stuff. He has done um, some Metallica arrangements. He's done some. Uh, he rewrote Eddie Van Halen's Eruption. It's called Reruption, and he just wrecks that thing on a seven-string Viper. Um, he told me he probably to leaves his tuned in straight fifths about 10% of the time. Uh, about 30% of the time, he takes his bottom four strings, so that would be G, C, F, and B flat, takes those each down a half a step. So he leaves E, A, D, leaves those alone, and then everything below D string goes down half a step. He calls that his drop A tuning. And that takes his B flat string um, all the way down to an A. Just heavy, 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 low, chunky, wall rattling sound. Um, I don't always listen to Chuck Bontrager, but when I do, so do the neighbors. Um, and then he spends, a, he said about 30% of his time in drop A tuning. The other 60% of the time he does in what's called lift D tuning. Um, and because he's treating this like a guitar, um, he, he wants to basically emulate drop D tuning on a guitar. So he takes his B flat string and tunes it up to a D. And you can do that. You can crank that thing down and, and tune it up to a D. And then he tunes this F string up to an A. And that allows him to start going after guitar parts. Um, so that's when he does his Metallica stuff. That's when he does his Tool stuff. That's all in lift D tuning. Um, and that's the great Chuck Bontrager. You can find him here on Facebook. He's a super cool guy. It may take him a month to get back to you because he doesn't spend all that much time on, uh, on Facebook. In fact, he did say, um, he did say that uh, he was going to be, Chuck's tuned in right now. He probably just can't hear us because he's in the, uh, he's in the pit at Hamilton. Um, he may be watching us. So everybody waved to Chuck, told him we'd wave. Um, he might be in the middle of playing, uh, you know, I don't want to miss my shot or something right now, but um, yes. So that is some of the drop tuning and alternate tunings that people are using. You can tune this thing however you want to tune it. We've actually got a blog post on electricviolinshop.com that talks about how to tune a six-string six string, It's a six-string violin if you want to play country on it. Um, if you want to play a six-string Violin. We'll let the Midwest come out a little bit there. Um, if you want to tune your six string violin like a guitar, where uh, from top you're going E, B, G, D, A, E. Um, if you want to tune it like a guitar, um, then we can tell you which strings to put on and how to tune them. Um, that's a blog post on electricviolinshop.com. I didn't write any of that down because uh, you guys can find it if you're willing to use the Google for just a second. 
Um, one of the other early questions that came was, what bow would you use to play those big stinking heavy strings? I like the Coda Bow Jewel. I'm a Coda Bow artist, so just full disclosure. And we sell Coda Bow here. So um, am I gonna be biased toward Coda Bow? Yes, but um, I was actually a Coda Bow customer before I was a Coda Bow artist. I paid for my Jewel vial, or for my Jewel Bow because I really liked the bow and then uh, established a relationship with those guys later and became an ambassador for Coda Bow. Um, but most of the players I know who play six and seven string violins are using a Coda Bow Jewel and they are really happy with it. The Coda Bow Jewel, you can see the frog is a little bit different design. Um, it sort of curves in here a little bit more like a viola bow would. And then this piece here, the, the nut is actually back a wee bit and that moves the balance point a little bit on the bow and it's also a wider shank here, so you can get more hair on this bow, so it will pull harder than your average violin bow will. Uh, but it is just as nimble because the stick is still a violin bow stick. It still has all the nimbility, is that a word? The nimbility of a, of a violin bow. You can still do all your stuff that would be mighty hard to do with a, with a viola bow because people will ask, hey, should I get a viola bow for pulling those heavy strings? If you like playing whole notes, you can. Um, but if you want to be able to rip a little faster, then, uh, you know, you probably want to uh, probably want to think about a violin uh, jewel. And it pulls a huge tone, even on a four string violin, it pulls a huge tone, but it can move these low strings. <laughs> Much harder to do with a regular violin bow. Um, Rob Flax was actually asking, um, Rob is an amazing four string player. Uh, he was asking about, hey, how do how, how do you, how does your technique differ on a six or a seven? And um, just for fairness' sake, um, I've been playing on this Viper a little bit. Let's uh, set that down. I don't have a seven string Jordan sitting right here, but I have a six string Jordan. So let's pick that up. We talked about uh, some Jordan violins, which I also like a whole lot. Um, so here is a uh, here's a six string Jordan. Um, so yeah, you can move that F string pretty well here. Um, there is a little more latency on that than there is when you first play your, uh, an E string, you know, it moves immediately. You get sound out of that immediately. Uh, if you're hitting this string, you got to get into it a little more and it does react a little bit slower, a little bit slower, unless you're really hammering this thing. I talked to Earl Manian for quite a while this morning and talked about what he does and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But if you're playing this with a more classical technique, um, it does, there is just, there's a hair more latency. There's a hair more time between when you decide I'm going to push that note and when the sound comes out. Um, th there's a little, there's a little more time. It takes a little more effort to move that, that F or that B flat string. Ernesto, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is the bridge sometimes minus and other divide? I don't know what that means. Uh, ask me a different way, Ernesto, and I'll try to I'll try to answer that. Um, so yeah, the bow we really do like the Coda Bow Jewel. Um, did talk to Earl this morning. He does not use a jewel. Um, he wants something really light because Earl plays insanely fast. He's doing uh, speed metal, basically. Um, he needs a super, super lightweight bow. He uses an Arcus, and, and he's just, Earl's like this jacked up dude. He's a, is a Muay Thai fighter. He's super, super strong. And, um, and he uses just brute strength to move the strings rather than the really the bow itself. Earl's almost using his arm to move the strings, uh, and the bow just happens to be between his arm and the string. Um, he's using an Arcus bow. It's about a three or $4,000 bow. Um, so if you're maybe looking for something, um, 
more affordable. Uh, the Jewel is like six fifty or something, six twenty something. I don't have all these prices memorized, but it's a whole lot cheaper than the Arcus bow. And uh, chances are you're not doing what Earl's doing. Um, Earl is very very unique in what he does. Um, some other questions that came in. Somebody was asking about frets and intonation in these lower strings. Let me grab my Viper that I'm much more familiar with. Um, woo. Grab my Viper off the wall here. Um, you could hear I was having a little trouble on the Jordan separating out um, the C string from the other ones. That is not my instrument. I'm not used to that instrument. And uh, it is... Uh, Sometimes it takes you a second to do some of the more subtle things on an instrument you're not used to. Um, so here's here's my Viper. Um, on this one, we talk about frets and intonation on frets. So you have to intonate these bridges when you put a bridge on. And you'll see this little, I've got a dollar bill sticking here. Um, that's another Chuck Bontrager trick, and it's to stop the after length on these strings from ringing. Because on, on a Viper, there's a really long after length. And when I'm doing distorted stuff, I'm hitting this a lot. You can hear my A string, but if I don't have this on here, you'll hear the after length on those strings will do this. You can hear that? I don't want that to ring when I'm doing heavy distorted stuff. And the wall moved. Go back where you were. Okay. Um, so, um, where am I at? The frets. On the fretted intonation of these, you have to adjust the angle of the bridge to get the frets to intonate properly. And we'll check on that. So we check those here, we check them here, and then we check here, and then we check here. So I, there's several different ways we can, um, that we can intonate, uh, check intonation on this, but you, you do that by moving the position of the bridge. There's a little bit of an angle on this bridge to compensate for the fact that the F and the C string are a little heavier. Um, but even with that, frets are not magical. There are no magical properties in any of this. And one of the reasons that wood violins um, is so low, um, so that you can play this violin out of tune. Okay, you can feel that fret underneath your finger, but it's not high enough to actually break the string there. Um, so when you're you just sort of need to establish a relationship with the instrument so that you know exactly where to play in relation to that fret based on what key you're playing in, if we're talking about uh, just temperament, or if you're playing an interval, if I'm doing um, bar chords, or if I invert that bar chord, I've got to know exactly where to play versus the fret to have that in tune in each key. So you can't just say, hey, I'm going to throw on the fret and it's going to be in tune. That's not exactly true, okay? So the frets are amazingly good locators and they're super helpful if you're in a loud environment and they're super helpful if you're singing and playing at the same time. But as far as having things exactly in tune using uh, just temperament or equal temperament, or if I'm, you know, if I want that that major third to be just a little bit bigger, I may stretch that out just a little bit versus that fret. So it's it's nice to know the if you spend hundreds of hours on this instrument, you will know exactly where that fret is and where I'm going to play versus that fret in each key and for each note. Okay, so no, they're not magic, and you don't just blindly trust them. Uh, but they do provide a whole lot more frames of reference um, on the fingerboard than just an empty fingerboard is if you're trying to sing and play or if you're in a really loud environment where you can't always hear yourself. So, yes, the question on frets um, and intonation is that you don't just blindly trust them, and that's true even on a four-string, okay? Um, 
So yeah, awesome. Well, I'm glad that helped. Um, so that was a question about frets. Who was asking me? I think it might've been Karen was asking about string spacing um, and like where the correct spacing and angles are. There's no such thing as exactly correct, okay? So on four strings, there, there is a commonly accepted uh, angles, spacing, distance, all that sort of thing. Once we go to five strings, all bets are off. And every five string manufacturer sort of makes their own uh, compromises. We talked about that extensively in the, in the video we did on five string violins. And six and seven strings, it's the same thing. I may go with a wider neck and give myself some more string spacing. If you're worried about people with small hands, you may go with a narrower neck and some tighter spacing. Um, the thing is the two best bridges that we know of for six and seven string violins are the Barbera Bridge and the Starfish Bridge. Um, they sound fantastic. It's what all the big dogs use. It's what Mark Wood's using. It's what John Jordan's using. It's what Vector's using. It's what the Skull Violins are using. Um, the, the Barbera and the, and the Starfish Bridges are the bridges that people want on solid body violins, okay? The Barbera Bridge, you cannot alter the curvature of that bridge. The way it is, is the way it is. You cannot alter the spacing of that bridge because you've got two piezos under each string. Where the spacing is on the bridge end is where it is. So you can alter on the, the nut end and you can get, you know, as those angles, as you're moving up the neck, they are gonna change, right? But, but the curvature and the spacing on a Barbera bridge, it is what it is. So you are constrained on one end of the fingerboard anyway, okay? On the other end, yes, you can go narrower or wider. Um, I've got big hands and I like uh, some better string spacing because I do occasionally, believe it or not, I do occasionally play classical music on my sixth string. Um, I've got some, uh, some Bach Partitas uh, arrangements that I do here. Um, I did a, uh, which concerto did I do? One of the concertos that I played with uh, my friend Emmanuel in New York, um, I wrote an arrangement to accompany him all that's classical stuff played on a six string and I did need the extended range for that, okay? So I like having a little bit wider string spacing because I have to do some of those uh, Bachian type chords on here while I'm playing. Um, if you have smaller hands, uh, Earl Manian actually has his, uh, Jordan was made with a three quarter size. Um, the neck is, is basically sized as if it were a three quarter size violin because he has smaller hands and he wanted to have access to all those strings and he plays just blisteringly fast. He didn't want a bunch of string spacing and just slow him down. So each manufacturer can do that differently. Um, there's a question here, do frets impact shifting and calluses? Um, no, I mean, uh, the, the wood violins frets are so low, you can sort of feel them as you go by. Just slide right over them. Calluses. I don't know, I've been playing fretted violin for 20 some years. So, I mean, my calluses are, are pretty solid. The tips of my fingers are pretty much dead. Um, so I don't know if it's any different on that for a force than a, than a fretless, I, I wouldn't know. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a control group to, uh, to test on that. Um, so yeah, each manufacturer is gonna do their six and seven a little bit differently. Um, I know I'm trying to think who else makes a, a six and seven, Aceto makes one. Um, there's some other guys that make them, um, but the ones that we carry are the Vector, the, 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 the Viper and the Jordan. Um, yeah. String sets. Somebody asked about string sets. I think it was Daniel Dininger asked about string sets. Um, somebody is asking, oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Ernesto, what we'll have to do, we'll have to talk about how, um, how yours is intonated. And every time you change the strings, you're gonna to have to re-intonate it. Um, we do have a video on our YouTube page on how to intonate a fretted Viper and how to, uh, how to check those different landmarks on here to make sure that your bridge is exactly in the right place. Um, so that is gonna be really helpful for you. Um, yes, yeah, Spur Violin makes a six. There's a, there's a bunch, uh, Electric Violin Luthery makes a six and a seven. Have not played any of those. So I can't talk about what they feel like. Um, but they're all going to be different because there is no, there is no convention. There's no rule that says that a six string neck is, is X number of millimeters wide. Um, 
what are the string sets? So pretty much everybody, not everybody, well, pretty much everybody who makes violin strings makes a four string set, right? Have to. A lot of those manufacturers make five string sets. Five strings are so common that many, many manufacturers are making five string sets. You can get a violin C and, and that's, a, that's a thing, okay? Uh, Sensicore is who makes the F and the B flat and the E flat string that everybody uses. There may be somebody else who's making them, but everybody that I know who uses six, seven, eight string violins, they're using Sensicore from F on down. Um, if you're not a big Sensicore fan, then maybe you want to use something else from G on up, and that's fine. A lot of people split their sets. Uh, Minor split. I'm using um, Helicores on some and Sensicores on some. Um, so yeah, you can split your set, and they're they're generally going to work real real nice together under most circumstances. Uh, F and B flat are so different anyway um, that you know they're just they're different. Um, does Dario make the lower strings? They do not. Since Core makes the lower strings. You use octave strings. I mean, if you want to, you can. Um, they they probably if you're using a fretted violin, they may not um, they may not intonate properly like a C string and a B flat string are gonna be different. Um, so they would intonate different. Um, but Chuck doesn't have any problem tuning his B flat all the way up to D or his F all the way up to A. Yes, Chris. Uh, Vision makes, do they make F, an F? F only, no B flat. Okay, they make an F. look at there. Tomastic makes a an F string. So F that, how do you like that? All right. Um, <laughs> What? He said, he said F string. You totally did that on purpose. A little bit. I did. I did that a little bit on purpose. Um, the, the F string, the lowered B flat, the same on a bassoon. I don't know. I've never played the bassoon. I assume, sure. I'm a rock guy. We don't use a lot of bassoons in rock and roll. Uh, we will talk about what all the strings are here in just a minute. I will get to that. Um, and, and where they compare to other instruments, like instruments people have heard of, not the bassoon. Um, uh, let's see. Somebody was asking about EQ. I think it was Akiva was asking about EQ. Um, the thing about EQ, EQ is what we adjust to make your instrument with your technique through your system and your ears all work well together, right? Count how many times I use the word your in that sentence. Your instrument, your technique, your system, yours in a sentence. Um, the only real general advice I can give is I like to use a high pass on pretty every channel, including kick and bass when I'm engineering. Um, so I'll, I can tell you what the uh, I can tell you what your what your hertz frequencies are for each string. Your low G on a four string violin is 196 hertz. So when you're setting your high pass filter. Um, you can set that all, all the way up to say 200 hertz. Remember, high pass isn't a brick wall. It's it doesn't take below 200 and just bump to zero. It's a second order filter, so it rolls off. Um, and they're generally, you know, you can control sometimes 12 or 24 dB per octave. Um, 24 is relatively steep, although it's still not a brick wall. Um, so if I set my high pass at 200. 196 is still coming through real nice and strong, okay? Um, your C string is at 130 hertz. So you can just keep that in mind if you're setting your high pass filter. Your F string is at 87 hertz. And then the B flat string is at 58 hertz. Um, so you can just keep that in mind. Honestly, if I had a seven string, I would still probably start with my high pass around 100 and then start dialing that back just until it sounded nice and balanced to my ears. Especially if I have a Barbera pickup, which tends to be a little heavier on the bottom end anyway. Um, the Starfish pickups tend to be more balanced. The, the, uh, the Barberas tend to be heavier on the bottom end. That's why I like a Barbera pickup because I need all that thunder coming out of there because um, we're conjuring up demons and whatnot and all that. Um, so that's what's going on with EQ. So 196 hertz, uh, 130 hertz, 87 hertz, and then the B flat string is down at 58 hertz. Um, somebody asked about impulse responses. If you're, if I, and I do, I use an impulse response on this a lot because sometimes I do want to sound like an acoustic violin, viola, cello, whatever. Um, so a violin body impulse response is going to start crapping out below about 
200 hertz. Uh, and it's because the violin body itself, the wooden body, is not designed to amplify sounds below about 200 hertz. So once you start getting down to C and F strings on a violin body impulse, they start dying out. They sound real thin, they sound real weak because that's what they would sound like on an acoustic violin body. It just can't pump those lower frequencies out. So you got two options if you wanna use an extended range instrument with a violin impulse response. You can get a hybrid impulse response, which means you take a cello body impulse, you take a violin body impulse, you cross them over, you time and line them, you do all that stuff, and then you blend them together so that your high strings, just like a violin, and then your low strings are gonna sound more like a cello. Um, it's a little bit of work, it can be done. Um, you can find cello body impulses out on the internet, violin body impulses out on the internet, they're out there, you can find them. Um, the other thing you can do is if you're using something like the V-Sound or you're using a, a more radar pedal or whatever, if you want to, you may want to blend in some of your dry sound and bypass the, uh, the impulse response so that your dry, heavy, thick um, sound can come through and then you're sort of sticking that impulse response off to the side so you get that woodiness off to the side. Um, that's another way to to not make it kill your super low frequencies. Um, did you push the button and I can't pull up this whole comment. Um, did you discuss how the lower range, and then it goes dot, dot, dot. Um, so, sorry, can't push C more and it didn't go. C more, C more, feed me C more. Oh, there it is. Um, Discuss the lower range of six and seven strings offers actually used. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, is there a genre where that expanded range is more effective? Oh, yeah. Um, series of real antique. To blah, blah. Um, yeah, okay. So there's a cool comment there on, on uh, YouTube if you guys want to read into that. Um, yes, there, there, yeah, we'll talk about why a six and seven string violin would, where would it actually be used? Um, so the, the question that, um, that David Wallace, who's head of the, the string department at Berkeley, what he wanted to point out, this is not just a violin, a four-string violin with a couple extra strings bolted on uh, because we got bored one day. Um, it is a separate instrument that is totally legitimate, is totally um, similar but different. It is its own thing, um, and there are a lot of people writing and performing for this instrument. I'm one of them. Um, there are much bigger names than me out there. Val Vagoda um, has a Broadway play that she does with her six-string Viper. Uh, David Wallace plays a six-string um, viola. Joe Denison plays a seven-string Viper. Rudolf Hawken plays, a, I think, a six-string Viper. He's a professor at University of Illinois. Tracy Silverman, if you guys don't know who Tracy Silverman is, we're done here. Uh, Tracy Silverman is probably one of the most famous six-string violinists uh, alive. Um, I did an interview with him for the Rockstar Violinist podcast. If you haven't listened to that, as soon as we're done here, go listen to that podcast. Um, uh, Nico Mooley is a, is a composer who has written a concerto for six-string violin. Tracy has written three concertos for six-string violin. John Adams has written concertos for six-string violin. Jesus Florido composes for seven string violin. Mark Wood, obviously the guy that invented this instrument who started making seven string violins back in the 1980s. Uh, Mark Wood has composed an incredible body of work for seven string violin. Earl Manian uh, out of New York, plays a, he plays a Jordan. He writes for seven string Jordan. Uh, Martha Mook is a violist out of New York. She writes for an extended range viola with a low F string on it. Uh, Lev Zurbin is another uh, seven-string composer. There are so many people writing so many uh, really amazing pieces of art. Um, Joe Denison, we talked about, that writing fantastic music for six- and seven-string violins. There's tons of literature out there. Um, so, yeah, Tracy Silverman was one of the first guys to say, hey, let's, let's do a, a power trio in a rock setting with violin, bass, and drums. He was doing this back in the 80s and 90s where um, he's got a, a trio that doesn't have guitar in it. 
uh, I'm about to release an album that doesn't have any guitar in it. It's much, much, it's pretty heavy. Um, it sounds like there's guitars in it. There's no guitars in it. It's all done with six string violin. So what that sort of brings us to is where the range of this instrument is versus other instruments. Somebody was talking about a bassoon. Um, if you're writing orchestral music, that's important. It's important to know. So let's talk about the, uh, the low F of a six string violin gets you two fifths below a violin. So two fifths you'd think is a tenth, but it's not, it's a ninth. It takes us an octave and a whole step below a violin. So if you want to, um, maybe I'll get to that in just a second. So there's your low G. So I can go an octave and then a full step lower than a four string violin. So I'm actually a whole step below an octave violin, but it still allows me to have my open E. So that's where you, that's what you can do with a six string violin. Gets you uh, an octave and a whole step below a four string violin. Um, it also gets me within a uh, half a step of the bottom note of a guitar. Uh, the bottom note of a six string guitar is an E, I've got an F. So guitar takes me to, takes me there. Um, and then I'm normally here. Um, I've got one of my original tunes was actually done in E, so I just, I just tuned the whole violin down a half a step. Um, so then I'm actually playing the things just basically tuning E flat. Um, a low B flat on seven string violin. Let's let's play some of that. Um, there is a significant difference in playability between a six string and a seven string, um, which is why I stopped at six strings. At least there is for me. Um, to me, a seven string is considerably more difficult to play. Um, but if you need that bottom end and you're willing to trade a little bit, for me the challenge. And, and it's um, is how straight up and down. You see where I am for my E string? Look how straight up and down the bow is on a seven string. And it's B flats here. My bow's almost vertical on an E string. Um, and I'm I'm sort of I'm getting old enough to where I'm starting to think about maybe one of these days I'm gonna start working on a beer belly here. Um, if you if you've got some if you if you've got body parts that are between you and the ground, um, a seven string you could be it could be a little bit in the way. You might have to sort of angle it back to get to that E string, so that you're not uh, you're not smacking yourself in in whatever body parts you might have between here and the ground. Um, so um, a seven string, I can get to um, a whole step below a cello. So your bottom note on a cello is a C. Um, so I get to B flat. It is a half step below the bottom note of a seven string guitar. If you guys are gent guys or heavy metal guys, a lot of times there's seven string guitars. Um, if you need to get below a seven string guitar, seven string violin will do that. It gets you a tritone above the bottom note of a bass guitar. You can't, so we're starting to get close. Um, and then you're an octave and a, and a whole step below a five string violin. So if you've got a low C, so this gets you below a five string octave violin. Um, and yeah, a, a regular viola. Um, so yeah, the seven, the six string violin to go back to that. It's that if you think of it as a viola with a high E and a low F, um, then maybe it's it's less uh, intimidating thinking of a violin with two lower strings. Um, just sort of depends on how you look at it. So Chuck's advice, which was awesome. We're gonna click on what Raz is coming here and I'm just gonna keep clicking until it works. Um, it says actually drop the shoulder and elbow for the low B flat and let the wrist T-Rex a little bit. Okay. Yeah, when Chuck plays his, it looks completely effortless. Um, so I would take Chuck's advice on that all day long. Yeah, it's like a B-flat cello with a violin on top. There's a way to think about it. Um, so that just sort of shows where you are versus other instruments. You're a tritone above the bottom note of a bass. You're an octave and change below a five-string violin. 
um, you're a whole step below a cello, you're a half a step below. Even on a six string, you're almost, was it three octaves between low F and high E? It's, it's a lot. Um, so that's what's going on with those. What are other people asking? We gotta get to all this. Oh yeah, somebody's asking about cover bands. I, uh, I toured with a cover band for two different cover bands for 10 years each um, with a five string violin. Um, but in those situations, I was playing with a band that had two guitar players. Uh, so there was two guitar players and me. As far as getting down into that low uh, F and B flat range, I would have just been in the way. Um, but for the last year that I was touring with my band here in North Carolina, I had a six string violin. Didn't use my F string a whole lot with that band um, because we did have two guitar players in that band. But um, with my original stuff, I do need low F string because I have completely replaced the guitar player. There's no guitar player in that band at all. Um, and when I do, I do a lot of church gigs around here. Um, having that low F string allows me to cover a lot of cello parts. If you listen to a lot of contemporary Christian music, there's a lot of cello and stuff in there. It allows me to cover cello parts, viola parts, violin parts, um, all together. Um, synth parts you can cover, uh, organ parts you can cover. You, can, you just take up a lot of space down there, especially if they get, if you've only, if you're, um, I do a lot of fill-in work now that I'm freelancing. Um, I'll play in a lot of bands that only have one guitar player. So if that guitar player, say I've taken a solo and he's been chunking away for me, when he goes to take a solo, no, I can start chunking away for him and it does the bottom doesn't fall out, right? Because otherwise, on a four-string violin, when the guitar player starts chunking away, well, you know, the best you can do is try to get to your G string and hey, you know, but that's that's like, that's near the top of his range. So how am I gonna get below him while he's soloing up, up high on the neck? How am I going to get below him to create some some sound floor so that he's got something to sit on while he's soloing? Uh, with a four-string violin, it's pretty hard. And with a five-string violin, even, you're really not getting there. Uh, six and seven-string, yeah, it allows me to get all the way down into his, you know, to his cowboy chord territory where I can chunk away for him as he's taking solos. Um, so, yes, in a cover band situation, it would be extremely useful Um especially if there's only one guitar player in a band. If there's two guitar players in a band, usually the, the rhythm player can handle all the low stuff and you can maybe cover some of the higher um, voicings. Um, but yeah, if there's only one other guitar player, then it, it is extremely helpful to have a six or a seven string violin. Um, trying to think, what other questions do we have? Um, yeah, one of the questions somebody asked, let's talk about what jobs we can take with a six or seven string violin. You know, we can take violin parts, viola parts, cello parts. We can cover guitar parts. We can cover all that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't like thinking so much in terms of jobs that we can take. I like thinking about what kind of jobs we can create because it's not a zero-sum game. It's not like there's only a fixed number of jobs and I'm going to displace this guy by doing this. Um, if you're a creator and you're writing and you're doing original things, um, you're not taking anybody's job. You're creating something new. Um, if, if you've got the pedals and you can make synth sounds and you can do string section sounds and you can do keyboard sounds and you can do guitar sounds, it's not, and then you've got all your own sounds too, right? Everybody says, well, it's trying to sound like this or trying to sound like that. I just sound like what I am. Um, so I say, well, it sounds like a guitar. No, it doesn't. It sounds like a violin run through an amp or it sounds like a violin run through an organ machine, or it sounds like a violin run through an octaver. It sounds like a violin because it is a violin. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I understand what people are saying. Hey, that sounds like a guitar. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it that way, it does. But um, really, if you look at it the other way, well, the guitar sounds like me. The guitar sounds like a violin because I'm playing a violin. How can less be more? Less isn't more. More is more! That's what Ingve said. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't necessarily talk about what jobs can we take. Although, you know, if you're if you're looking at a, a, a film score situation and the hey we got a cello chair here and we don't have a cellist, yeah, you can you can take you can sit in a cello chair with a seven string uh, Viper and be just fine, or a seven string whatever and be just fine. Um, you can sit in a viola chair. You can sit in a violin chair. Uh, 
you know, I don't know how good you are with a pick. Uh, I do actually play my violin with a pick sometimes, but uh, in theory, you could cover a lot of guitar stuff uh, with a seven string violin or a six string violin tuned down um, and cover a lot of guitar stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, jobs we could take. I like thinking about jobs we can create. So um, yes. I do know there are some new people here that have popped in. So I do want to go back through some of these composers' names again um, and grab your quill or something and write it down. Whatever, whatever you write with, because you're probably watching me on your phone right now. Uh, and you can't be typing on your phone while you're listening. So grab, you know, maybe write it in the dirt on the dash in your car or something. Um, but composers, Jesus Florido, um, who has been part of Rockstar Violinist podcast. Mark Wood, who's also been part of the podcast. Earl manian has been on the podcast. Martha Mook has been on the podcast. Val Vagoda has been on the podcast. David Wallace uh, has been interviewed. We just haven't released uh, his interview yet. Joe Denizan has been on the podcast. Rudolf Hawken has been on the podcast. Tracy Silverman has been on the podcast. Uh, Nico Mooley has not. John Adams has not. Uh, Lev Zerbin has not been on the podcast. But these are all guys that are writing for six and seven string violins. Um, really, really cool stuff. And like I said, uh, Mark Wood's been making six and seven string violins since the 1980s. Uh, not a completely new thing. Although in like galactic time, it's it's new um, but it's not, it's not something that got invented in, in, you know, 2015 or anything. So, uh, yeah, six and seven string violins. It's a thing. It's a legit thing. Are there some trade-offs? Yes. Uh, I will say that a six string violin or a seven string violin is a little more unwieldy than a four string. It's just how it goes. There are trade-offs. You are going to have to trade off a little bit of, uh, unwieldiness in order to have all of that range. Um, that being said, I've had my six string for a year and a half now, almost two years, and I've got enough hours on it. I, I don't have any problem playing Bach partitas on it. It's, I, I can do it. Um, in fact, when I, when I play them on my four, I don't really feel like it's that much easier to play a Bach partita on a four string than it is on a six string. Um, just once you get enough time on the instrument, it starts to become a part of you and, uh, and it just, you can do it. Um, seven strings for me are, are, are more difficult to play, but I don't have a thousand hours on a seven string yet. Maybe one of these days. So, um, yes, I hope that answers all of your questions about six and seven string violins. If you have some comments or some questions that you want to dump into the comments section, either uh, on YouTube or on Facebook, I'll do my best to answer those. Um, how is the sound of the lows compared to an electric cello? Uh, I just played it. Um, I would say that you probably would have a very hard time telling the difference, um, especially if I'm using the right technique. Uh, this is one of the things that Chuck uh, helped me with when I was recording I was doing some stuff on an octave violin and Chuck said he listened to one of my early mixes and they said yeah I can tell it's not a cello and the reason I can tell it's not a cello isn't the sound it's your vibrato you're using violin vibrato you should be using cello style vibrato and and once he coached me through that um, I've had cello player friends listen to that particular tune and did not know that it was not a cello um, so yeah, I, I think once if it's a lot of it is technique. It's not just finding the note. It's the way a cellist would articulate that note. It's the way a cellist would would vibrato that note. It's the way a cellist would attack that note. Um, uh, if, if you'll think like a cellist and play like a cellist, people will think they're listening to a cellist. Um, so, yeah, that was a great question. If there's no more questions. I'm gonna, I noticed the sun came out. I'm gonna go work on my tan a little bit, which as you guys can tell is uh, necessary. Um, sorry, is how it is. Um, I'm, I'm pasty. So yeah, sun came out. Maybe it's gonna help my, help improve my bad hair day. I'll go work on my tan and we'll see you guys uh, next week, okay? I have no idea what we're gonna talk about next week, but it'll be something, something good. Tell me something good.